great, great pleasure to have uh, Hamlet Ishwar in here to deliver our uh, next uh, sort of second in our seminar series in biostatistics here at, at UM. Um, Hamlet and I go way back. We've been working together for about 12 years now. And um, he's, he's a, an extremely I interesting guy in terms of the, the breadth of work that he gets involved in and his ability to marry theory with applications and his ability to translate things into uh, computer applications that people can actually use and do use around the world. So he's a very, very sort of cross-cutting uh, kind of researcher. Uh, he, he got his, I just want to read from this so I make sure I get everything right. He's, he got his PhD in statistics uh, at Yale University in 1993 working with David Pollard. Uh, before that, he was at Oxford University doing his master's, and earlier to that, he was at the University of Toronto where he got his uh, bachelor's degree. Uh, he's got a wide range of interests, um, from cancer staging to random forest, which is what we'll see today, uh, to Bayesian and frequentist variable selection, uh, modeling high-throughput genomic data, mixture models, non-parametric bays, a variety of different things, some very theoretical, some more applied. He's currently an associate editor for the Journal of the American Statistical Association, the Theory and Methods section, the Electronic Journal of Statistics, and Statistics and Probability Letters. Um, as I said, there's, a, there's some software that he's developed. Um, part of it I've been involved with, part of it uh, he, he's had a long history of doing this. Um, for example, the BAM Array software that we, we jointly worked on, that's for uh, genomic analysis of uh, high throughput uh, microarray data. And then some of it, which is more related to his work today, on random forest for survival, classification, and regression data. This is also get, getting some wide distribution around the world. So it's a great pleasure for, for uh, us to have him here. And uh, today he's going to speak on random forests, uh, theory, and applications for variable selection. So welcome. Dan. OK, well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so today I wanted to talk about random forests. Um, actually, applications of uh, random forest in terms of variable selection. This is a little bit different because um, random forest is a machine learning technique or sometimes called a statistical learning technique, which is often thought of as a black box tool for doing prediction. But um, there are many scenarios where it can actually be used for variable selection. So I wanted to talk about that by um, talking about um, the classical method used for variable selection and use some examples to illustrate that. Then also I want to get into some new methods that we've developed um, and illustrate those both uh, theoretically and as well through some applications. Um, so first, when I, when I was putting together this talk, I thought, well, I'll just jump right in and start talking about variable selection. But um, uh, given the fact that maybe there's sort of a very you know, broad background in the audience, um, I decided to instead um, start off with a little bit of an introduction, some background material. But rather than talking about random forests, I'm going to talk about something else, which is called bagging, which stands for bootstrap aggregating. Um, this is a method due to Leo Bryman in 1996. Um, and this is also um, an ensemble method, just like random forests. And, and in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to argue that random forests is really just a specialized version of bagging. So let me, uh, let me just uh, start off by um, uh, highlighting how uh, Bryman actually described bagging in his, uh, in his original paper. So the, the first part, it's actually a two-part uh, description. So the first part is um, <clears throat> bagging predictors is a method for generating multiple versions of a predictor and using these to get an aggregated predictor. So this is all about prediction error. Okay? It's all about um, sort of averaging and perturbing. Okay, so the, the perturbation, and this is a, actually pretty much the, you know, 99% of bagging applications work by using the bootstrap. So you resample the data, and then you grow your predictor, and then you average, you ensemble, take an ensemble of these, these different predictors. Um, but one thing that you may be confusing is that this is not a bootstrap. So we use the bootstrap here as a way to perturb the data. We're not really using the bootstrap to approximate the distribution for a test statistic. Um, the second part of this description is when it works, okay? So if you could perturb the learning set, right, by taking the bootstrap as an example, um, and if this can cause a significant change in the predictor constructed, then bagging can improve accuracy, okay? And, and this is actually what, what Bryman and, and ha now is commonly referred to as instability. So if you have an unstable predictor, it's a prime candidate for being a good um, bagged predictor. 
and I'll get into that um, shortly enough. So I wanted to start by, um, by uh, an example. So I'll, I'm going to look at um, bag classification trees, so cart trees. And uh, what you see uh, on the left-hand side is um, mm -hmm. a classification tree um, grown um, using just a small cancer data set. So in this particular data set, we have patients who uh, either had prostate cancer or they did not. And the goal here is to create a classification rule to distinguish these two types of patients based on, in this case, two variables, uh, tumor volume and PSA level. So um, CART and, and more generally recursive partitioning trees are very greedy data structures, mm -hmm. right? So they rip through the data and they do it in a very greedy fashion. Um, so if you look at any given terminal node, and so the top of the tree is called the root uh, sorry, if you look at any node and the, and the top of the tree, which is called the root node, um, essentially what you do is you just go over all the data. You go over every variable, you look at every possible split point, and you choose that split point that, based on a greedy splitting rule, best separates the population. So typically in classification trees, the splitting rule used is um, what's called the Gini index. Um, and once you find this split point in this variable, so in this case, tumor volume, so all patients whose tumor volume is less than this number go over here, everybody else goes over here, you then repeat this recursively on the left daughter node and the right daughter node. So it's a recursive procedure, and it's very greedy. Um, so, so this is done until um, you get to the, the terminal nodes, and uh, in the case of a classification tree, the predictor is just formed by doing majority voting. So over here, um, the number of non-disease patients are in the majority, and that's your predicted value, OK? Um, now, um, this is actually, so, so the CAR tree is actually a bona fide predictor, right? In the sense that if you take a, a patient and you drop it down the tree, they're actually going to end up in a unique terminal node. And in that terminal node, you'll get their predicted value. Okay, so another way to, to think about this is that um, what the, the predictor really is sort of doing here is it's forming a partition of the X um, variable space, okay? And because of the way that, um, that the splits are done, the, um, the partition is such that it's just a bunch of these little rectangles, okay? They're non-overlapping rectangles. And they're designed in such a way that the edge of any rectangle is always going to be parallel to the coordinate axes of the x variable space. Okay? And um, in fact, on the right hand side, you could see um, the decision space that's carved out by this uh, tree on the left hand side. Um, so the, the white and, and green points are the actual observed data points, and they've been color coded. Um, based on the true class label, whether the patient was, um, had cancer or not, okay? And you can see um, the blue area where the classification tree predicts um, that the patient is not diseased. It's doing a pretty decent job um, of sort of separating these two groups out, although there is a um, little bit of um, problems in the middle. There's some misclassification occurring in the middle. Um, maybe some points over here, but you know, generally speaking, it's doing a decent job. The other thing that's kind of interesting about trees is that if you look at it, you can see that the decision boundary is rectilinear, right? It's this very sort of very straight and very nicely defined thing, and that's again a very it's a that's a special feature of using um, a binary tree, a recursive binary tree. Okay, so um, so here's how bagging would would work in the, in this scenario. Okay, so what I did was. Um, I drew uh, 999 bootstrap samples, and, and on the basis of each of these, I grew a tree uh, independently based on that particular sample. And what you can see here are, are um, some of these trees, uh, tree 2, tree 5, two, tree 25, and 1,000. Tree 1 is the original data set, um, and this is grown based on the original full data set, but I guess that's a, a special type of bootstrap sample. Um, the other thing I did was slightly different than tree one. I actually grew these trees out fully, okay? So I grew them out so that um, there was exactly one observation per terminal node. So that's a deep tree. Okay, so um, I guess the first thing to notice is that 
When you bootstrap the data and you go deep tree, you can get very different types of tree structure. So you can see the decision boundaries very different from uh, tree one to tree 25 and so forth. Okay, and so Baggy is gonna, is gonna take advantage of this. Uh, the bottom row are the bag trees, so that's tree one, and then this tree here is the combination, the, a the aggregate uh, bag tree from aggregating tree one and tree two. And as you can see, what it's doing is it's sort of synthesizing information from the two trees. It's, it's taking both trees and carving out a slightly different decision boundary. Um, when you go to the, uh, let's say, the first five trees, you can start to see that the decision boundary is, is, is being carved out in a way that looks like it's trying to get at those points that were misclassified in the center. And then there's this sort of funny island over here. And after a thousand trees, you can see sort of a complex decision boundary emerging, which does pretty much just that. Okay, so this ensembling is a technique for using the different tree structures that you get by perturbing the data. Um, and this translates into prediction accuracy, improvement in prediction error. So if you look at the misclassification error rate, in this case, um, computed using out of bag data, for the bag tree, it's 27.2%. Um, for any given single tree, the average over all the out-of-bag data sets using that as uh, test data is 34.9%. So it's a decent improvement in prediction accuracy. And such a simple technique, right? You didn't have to do anything different. If you could grow, if you could grow a tree, just grow 1,000, take the average. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, so we sort of know how to do bagging. Um, but when does it work? So that's the second part of the description by Bryman. And, and that, the key has to do with instability. Okay, so um, I think if you think about it, you might be able to convince yourself that this is really sort of about the variance, right? So when we're perturbing the data, we're really sort of saying, hey, let's pretend we actually had another data set and grow a tree and see what we get. So instability is really sort of how much does a tree vary around the average tree? Okay, and that's, that's what we call variance. Um, so this plays a role with, um, with trees that are deep because as you grow a, a deep tree, like I did um, in our previous example, you're, kinda, you're using up a lot of degrees of freedom. So when you use up a lot of degrees of freedom, uh, bias goes down and that's great, but at the same time, you know, nothing's for free, variance goes up, okay? So that's the bad thing. And you might argue, well, why do that then? So if you're gonna get high variance, don't do that. But the problem is that in complex decision boundary scenarios, you have no choice. The only way to get at a deep tree is to, uh, sorry, the only way to get at a, at a complex decision boundary is to grow a deep tree. 